It's the products that we can produce that they can't. Yes. It's the service of our expertise of guiding them through the process and seeing things through. I'm not interested in supplying my clients with digital files that they will not do anything with. Yep. That's not service to me. Yeah. So let's, let me, now you bring that point up, I want to get right to the heart of like people asking for the digital, is there's this, there's this DIY trend where um, I think you've talked about this in the past where we all have had clients who are very artistic, who, who do like have made a, a nice album for their, for their travel photos like several times. They are a step above like the normal client and that's going to continue to happen. But typically, the, we, we also have seen the vast majority of clients who say they just want the disc the, because it relieves the tension. Like I've always, I, one of my favorite marketers talks about uh, marketing is about creating tension, about I, I need to do something, I need to take action. Otherwise, um, I, like I'm un, uneasy, right? When you just give somebody the images, you're relieving this tension because in their mind, they're going, oh, sweet, I have these now. I'm going to make prints of this or make a great book tomorrow. And it's always tomorrow because the tension's gone. Whereas when you work with them um, and with the, the goal up front, the expectation set up front, that you're coming to me to create art and to create an into so we can create art for your home and a book and all of these things, then that expectation is set from the beginning and it's you have a deadline associated with it. So, okay, forget that tangent. I want to come back to when, pe when people are asking you and and I know you, you've coached other photographers on this also. I just want the, can I just get the digitals? Because I'm going to make the book myself. Or I'm gonna, all I need is this because I want to share them online. What do you say? Okay. Well, I'm even going to back up from there a little bit. Um, first of all, I think you know much of the basis of what I support uh, photographers in doing is getting very clear on what their purpose is and why they're a photographer and what's important. Them. You have to get clear on that first. Yeah. Once you're clear on that, I only call, honestly, I don't deal with this issue very much because I only call forward the clients that are looking for what I have to offer. Yeah. I'm a service product based photographer and I make it's very clear. I use what I call, what I call a tribe identifier. Uh, and a tribe identifier is not a slogan. And I don't think a tribe identifier is something you can make up when you're going to business. It has to come from the experience of working with the clients who uh, want what you offer and yeah. then get an understanding. So, for example, when one goes to my website, and, and any of your viewers are welcome to at jeffreyshaw.com, there's, um, you know, under photography, there's my portfolio. The first slide that comes up in my portfolio is what I call my tribe identifier. And, and, and my tribe identifier is, uh, says something like, you value your family above all else and are eager to find a photographer that your children love to be around. If having Here's the key. If having portraits and albums to preserve cherished memories makes you smile and fills your heart, welcome. Okay. I don't get a lot of requests for digital files. I make it very clear before you look at a single one of my photographs that if you if if having portraits and albums fills your heart, welcome. Okay? So I'm already making sure I'm aligning myself with people who share my value. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean I don't get the requests. Yeah. Uh, I love what you said about the tension, and um, I look at it as the real conversation begins with no. That's when the real conversation begins. Again, our fear comes up when we hear a no, whether we're delivering the no or hear a no. When I'm asked, hey, you know, do I get all the files? I say no. Now let's talk about why you would want them and what I can do for you to create a win-win. Okay? When I talk to them about why they want them, oh, I want to share with my other friends. That's terrific. I have the perfect thing for you. I don't call it, I call it a, a shareable digital album for your smartphone because they don't want to know what sticky albums means. Um, they say, well, you know, I just feel like I should have them. I was like, would it make you feel better to know that I archive my images for as long as I can possibly keep them in multiple forms? I assure you they're much safer with me than they are for you. You know, those two issues. When, so first thing I do is ask, why do you think you want them? And it's become almost a habitual question. People aren't even sure why they want them. And the reason they want them aren't truly important. Now, the exception is there are a, some, what well, you were saying before about the D, DIYs, um, I kind of call them the creatives. Yeah. But they are few and far between. The, most people that are asking for the digital files for, I think, most photographers are looking to save money. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Again, I don't want to pander to the lowest common denominator in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I will satisfy the need. If I truly believe I'm working with a client, and I have a couple of clients who are art directors, and they are creatives. They want the file. So I will do an all digital session. But you know what? It is I charge close to my average sale. It, this is not. It's not a low cost option. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's not intended to be a low cost option. If they truly value and respect my imagery and my artistry, um, and that serves them best, which is my my main objective, yeah. then I will. But I'd say it's maybe twice a year. Um, I get the requests, but I'm very clear on my business model. But even more importantly, I very clear on who I call forward that is looking for my service. So let's let's pull that apart from and. And to be fair, you have a lot of inertia in your business. You've you've created a, 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 an awesome brand. You've got word of mouth. Your your perfect customer is friends and their network and they, your customers because they understand your brand so well. I just stumbled across a good aha thing. Um, you know, you're p- portraying the right brand when your friends and your your cl- your clients are referring the right people, right? It's Bingo. always it's always a we've all had it happen where one of your clients refers somebody and you're like um, I don't I don't do that I don't there's whether it's like I don't do weddings or I don't do this or no we don't do when you you know you're doing a, a good job of, of emanating your brand and what you're about when your your clients know exactly who they're going to refer you to. Exactly. Right? And you know how to answer that. So you're at a cocktail, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Yeah. If you're at a cocktail party and somebody asks you, what do you do? What do you say? Um, that's, what do I do? I start very simple. I've learned, I used to like give them and just go on and on and on. But right now I say, I started a website for photographers. And I ask, and I try as quick as I can to ask them, like what, what do they do, what their background is. So I... I hate talking to an audience if it's just one person or to a hundred if I don't know much about them, because mm-hmm. I, I know it's not going to re- it's not going to mean anything unless I can help talk about it in their their language. So what what I what I'm going to offer you and, and anybody else watching as a tip when somebody asks you what do you do, what I want you to hear is that as if they're really asking you who can I refer to you, answer it as if they are asking you who can I refer you to. Yeah. Okay. So when people say to me, hey, what do you do? I say, my clients commission me to photograph their families and children on location at their vacation homes or second homes. Okay, that says a lot. It does. Do you get a sense of who my client is? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm directly referring to their second home or beach homes. These are people with multiple homes. Yep. You know, and I use the word they, and I, I also am careful to say my clients commission me. It's not, I am. I'm taking it out of me and putting it in real life. My clients commission me. So you're right. It's it's you know that your bland, brand is clear when people are referring you people that are just like them. Yeah. Then they know what you're all about and they know who and, you are. And, and to other people, they even if it's like, like, yeah, they know which customers, which friends that aren't going to be a good fit, right? Because okay. when, we, when we really start to unpeel, and this is like another tangent you go on for hours, is the, uh, the concept of a word of mouth referral is it's really it's something we do in service to our friends and it's i think it's becoming an, an increasingly important thing where we take our referral really seriously absolutely whether we're doing it on on social media or wherever we're always being asked to do it now all the time but it's so it, it really does mean a lot when for me it's the number one metric i care about is when photographers are willing to refer sticky albums to their to their colleagues or to their friends, right? That means more to me than any other metric I, I look at because th- I think that that capital that we have to refer to our leveraging our own reputation because when you when your clients refer, I feel safe enough and confident enough to refer their friends. That means a lot, and I think right. the different type of people they refer is going to really start to show yeah. too. Right. So let's wrap up with, um, I'm a, I'm a brand new photographer. I'm just getting getting started. I'm a little nervous to do in person sales. What is what's some some pieces of advice? Where do I start? Um, do I do like screen share? Do I how do I? You can answer that question in in combination with the the digital image one. Sure. Um, so go ahead. Okay. Well, I think uh, 
I think it's wise to have a basis of the way you believe your business model work, will work best. Okay. Uh, and I'm very much in support of having other things in your back pocket. So for example, there are plenty of photographers whose business models have existed on in-person sales with projected images. Um, that's fine and good if that works for you, but it cannot be your sole way of making your sales because I assure you there are plenty of people, even in, no matter how niche your market is, there's, there are plenty of people that that does not serve because they simply do not have the time to get all the decision makers to your studio when it's convenient for all parties involved. Right. Okay? So if you don't have other ways in your pocket, you're shortchanging yourself and you're probably creating a tremendous amount of resistance amongst the people that you're actually trying to serve. Right. Okay? So, you know, uh, that may be the basis, but if you have a client who can't pull it all together, a screen share might be an additional option or packing up your projector and going to their home is another option. Mm -hmm. uh, my basis is doing online screen share sales, which comes from, uh, I had a storefront for 20 years and people came into my gallery uh, either to see proofs, I've actually never projected an image, but that's, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I, I, I've never needed to because I've sold from a place of confidence and expertise. So I never had to show it any bigger than a four by five inch proof in, in that day. Yeah. And then of course when the industry went digital, I, I just used back-to-back uh, -back, uh, monitors to, cool. to share the images. I've never projected anything large yeah. uh, and never needed to. Um, but when the time came, it was clear to me it was getting challenging to get people to come into my gallery just to their own, uh, due to their own schedules. I went to online screen share and I, and I offered that choice to my clients with a rather hefty deposit for fear um, that, wow, if I put them online, people are, what if, what if they never place a sale? I wanted to make sure I got paid enough up to that point as if they were never going to come back. Okay. And uh, what I found is actually once I made that offer, people always choose service over money. I think as small business owners, we give way too much excuse to the power of money. Given the choice, people chose service and convenience in their lives over money. So they laid down a deposit and had the chance for me to serve them better by doing a screen share. And the amount of money was such that it relieved me of any pressure of even having to make a sale so that I was in a much better place of being able to deliver to them true service, not coming from a place of sales. Um, does that? That's perfect. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, um, you know, just having more than um, more than one way yeah. to deliver your sales. The other, I, I think it's a it's a really good thing where a lot of people I think well that's the first um, there's we we all have a long list of objections as to why I, I can't do in person sales. Like yeah. I still work a, I still have a day job, so I don't have the time. I don't have a studio. I like I've heard so many answers. Well. Um, I think that if you're, my recommendation to people who are just starting out is to find a way to try it. The, the most exciting thing about being an entrepreneur and a, a sole business owner is there is no right way, there is no manual you have to follow. Yeah. Try yeah. all of, there is so yeah. many different approaches out there. It's not going to hurt. What is the worst thing that can happen? Right. Always be asking yourself, what's the very worst thing that can happen? And I, tr I promise you that your clients will respect your authenticity and right. just being, you know what, I'm, ask for feedback when it's done. Like, how did that work for you? Like, you can meet in a coffee shop. You can meet in their homes. All of these, there's so many strengths to each one of these. Yeah. And then there's the, the remote sales where you're doing a screen share. Yeah. Try all of them and see right. what works for you, right? And, and it may be a different different approach to different clients. I also want to make sure, Nate, that you and I are, are speaking to, like you had asked about the new photographer, and that's what was on my mind, and I, I paused there for a moment. I want to make sure that we're addressing the needs of someone just coming into the business. Um, and one of the suggestions I would make is understand that you're coming from a place of, if scales are, are scary to you, maybe a little creepy, you are coming, understandably, that's, you're kind of pre-wired for that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I like to do is to help uh, shift the internal, almost physical reaction that we have in the fear of sales is what act of generosity can you bring into that appointment, that experience that gives you the pure pleasure of watching somebody receive a gift from you? Yep. I mean, it is so powerful. It is literally a way of rewiring the body so that instead of having that experience, I'm afraid of sales. If you go into the appointment knowing I'm going to do something really cool to surprise somebody and I'm going to get to see them tear up or I'm going to get to see them, uh, you know, express their appreciation, mm -hmm. the fear of walking to that appointment goes away. Mm -hmm. 
right? So that's one of my first tips to a, 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 someone starting out is to just you know understand where you're coming from, give yeah. yourself you know have some empathy for that, and begin the process of rewiring what you think. Absolutely, that's really good advice. I like it. I want to. I'll wrap up with um, just just to recap some of the things about being like really listening to our negative whatever negative story you have about what it means to be in sales and whatever you're afraid of to to just let go of that and try a little bit try one little tactic a little here and just being transparent with your audience and and um, experimenting with it because that's not what sales is anymore and it's not going to work and the last thing is when we talk about really educating what just mean from what I hear my background is in education and when we are taking the time to walk our clients through all of the different choices they have and so that they they can see our credibility they can see that your expertise and then you can recommend and give advice is this is what I recommend this would fit well in your home this 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 image would go better on this frame and this place all of those things are really valuable things um, one of the things to keep in mind in all sales is to make sure you're listening first, right? So yes, we are talking about teaching and, and walking through and explaining a lot, but you're going to do far better at explaining things when you first take the time to listen to your clients. That's okay. why going in somebody's home can have a lot of positives, but starting the conversation, building rapport, asking questions about what were they looking to create, what are some things their friends have that they really like, understanding what they value, and then when you go in to, to walk somebody through it, it's not just a perfectly rehearsed pitch, because that's phony, but it's a conversation you're having with, yeah. with your, your client. Yeah. helping them make the best decision for themselves. So. I, can't, I can't help myself. I know you want to wrap this up. I can't help myself with one more it. tip. One more tip. Yeah, I love it. We're going to break this into two videos. I love it. Is uh, improv. Yeah. Take improv class. Yes. I've, yes. Improv is one of the greatest skills you can learn to listen to people and pick up where they left off and not have your own agenda because you don't know what's coming at you. Yes. So I'm a big proponent of taking improv classes. I've taken multiple classes, not only to improve my presence with, with my clients, yep. but also for public speaking. It's all improv. I have no idea what somebody's going to ask of an audience. As a and, photographer, being on a shoot, you've got to be ready for everything. Improv. I think in, learning, in, in, it, improving your skills of improv is one of the great, I think it's completely underrated, one of the greatest skills we can learn because it teaches you to be fully present and listen at a degree that most of us just inherently don't live our lives in doing. Yeah. Great. Take an improv class. That's such great advice. The number one, what's the number one takeaway for me, I did it in high school, is you always say yes. Like no blocking, right? That's just, it's an offer. Whatever is coming at you, just say yes to it first. And then yeah. it's, it's like a generator of thing where you can just keep the momentum going. But as soon as you start saying no and blocking in an event, that's, it starts to get awkward. Yeah. Yeah. My teacher uses the phrase, everything's an offer. Ah, you know, I like it. No matter what comes at you, it's an offer. Yeah. You know, so somebody asked you for your digital files, it's an offer for you to explain the principles of your business. It's an offer for you to define what service means to you. It's an offer for you to ask them, what they really want them for and to understand more about them. Yeah. Complete offer. Yeah. Offer and service. There we go. It. Well, Jeffrey, this was so much fun. Um, we're going to probably do some additional videos in this sequence. Uh, we don't have a huge like set structure to them, so guys, stay tuned. We're going to powwow and have some even greater tangible content that you guys can take and start applying in your business. This is We obviously have so much to talk about. We're going to break this into smaller chunks in the next video. I'm going to talk about why that's so important as well. So thank you guys so much for staying tuned, and we'll catch you next time. All right. Thanks, Nate.